What we want to do now is be able to find any one of these items given the other three. So really, there are four formulas. There's a formula for finding interest, one for finding principal, one for finding rate, one for finding time. But the author of our textbook has a nice little diagram that makes it easy for us to remember. If you'll just remember this little diagram where I is on top of the line and PRT is under the line, this works just like our portion base rate formula did. Whatever letter we're looking for, we cover that up and whatever's left is the formula for finding that thing. So if you want to find interest, cover up the I. Interest equals principal times rate times time. When letters are next to each other, that means multiply, doesn't it? When something is divided by a horizontal line, that means divide. So if we're looking for principal, we cover up the letter P. Principal is equal to interest divided by rate times time on the bottom. If we're looking for rate, it's equal to interest divided by the other two letters on the bottom. If we're looking for time, it's equal to interest divided by the other two letters on the bottom. So really, if you'll just remember this little diagram, you'll have all four formulas. You won't have to remember four of them. You can get them all from that little diagram. So let's look at a situation. What we're, go we're, what we're going to do is we're going to do the same problem over and over and we have to pretend we don't know the answers when we work it again. So let's do the first example. It says Tim Jarvis paid the bank $19.48 interest at 9.5% for 90 days. How much did Tim borrow? Well, we have to make sure we label our numbers correctly. They tell us he earned $19.48 interest. What's the next number they give us? 9.5%. And what's the other number they give us? 90 days. Okay, these are the three numbers they give us. Let's try to assign letters to those. The easiest one is always the one with the percent sign. What's that? That's the rate, isn't it? The one that has days or months or years is what? That's the time. So this dollar amount is either the interest or the principal. And it says he earned that much interest. So that's the I, isn't it? So we're going to assume they're going to be asking us for the letter P. All right? But just to make sure, let's read what question they ask. The last line of the problem is always the question, how much did Tim borrow? Does P represent the amount that somebody borrows? Yes, it does. Principal is the amount borrowed. So we're looking for principal. We're given the other three. So what's the formula for principal? It is interest divided by rate times time. So principal is equal to interest on top divided by rate times time on the bottom. How's that feel? All right, now let's plug in our numbers. The interest is $19.48 on top. The rate is 9.5% on the bottom. And the time is 90 days. Now we're going to have to really be careful. First of all, Whenever we see time that's not in years, we're going to have to divide it by something. Either 12 if it's in months, or what if it's in days. 360, we always assume ordinary interest. And now we really have to be careful with how we punch this in on a calculator. What we have here in this blue circle is what we call a complex fraction. It has a main fraction line. Here's the main numerator. Here's the main denominator. But notice there's a fraction in the main denominator. There's a fraction within the fraction. And so we have to be very careful or we'll get the wrong answer. Now there are two ways to approach this. I'll do the way the book approaches it first. The book says whenever you have a complex fraction or whenever you do one of these problems, do the denominator first. Do the denominator first. All right? So, let's find the denominator first. And we might have to, you can't really start with a percent 
when you're using your calculator. So you might have to do that as a decimal, or you could start with 90 times 9.5% divided by 360. Let's do that. Let's do 90 times 9.5% divided by 360. And we should get a decimal, which is 0, 0.0 what? Two something? Does it keep going on threes? Two, three, three, seven, five? Two, three, seven, five. Okay. Is that what everybody gets? Point zero, two, three, seven, five. Now, we could write that down. We could punch in 1948 divided by and then punch that in again and say equals. But every time you write something down, there's another chance to make a mistake. We could write it down incorrectly. Then we're going to punch it back in again. That's another chance to make a mistake. You can do it that way, but let me show you about your memory key. A simple calculator should have a key on it that says something like that, M plus. If you have a scientific calculator, it probably says STO. How many of you have a simple calculator? Anybody have a scientific with the STO? Okay. When we're sitting there with this point zero two three seven five, it's especially important if that is not a terminating decimal, if it goes on forever. Because if we put it in memory, it'll keep all those decimal places out there. Whereas if we write it down, we can only write down what we see in the display. So we'll be rounding it off and get an inexact answer. So with this point zero two three seven five in the display, press the M plus key or press the store key and then press the number one. You won't see the display change, but you should see some sort of little M appear in the display somewhere, meaning you've just put something in memory. Now, let's punch 1948 divided by, and now we're going to bring back that number from the memory that we just stored. So, simple calculator is probably something like MR, memory recall, or MRC, memory recall. If you'll press that, you should see the point 02375 again. If you have a scientific calculator, there's a button near the store button that says RCL, and you want to recall what's in memory one. Scientific calculator has nine different memories. You can store it in memory one or two or three, so just always use one. So we punch in 1948 divided by, bring back the memory. Now it should say point 02375. Now we punch the equal sign, and that's our final answer. And what is that? 820 to the nearest penny. 21. Does that sound right to everybody? Okay. Now, the critical thing on these problems is knowing how to punch them in on the calculator. Because, you know, setting them up is not that difficult. And we've got the numbers there, but we have to make sure we punch them in correctly. We have to make sure we punch them <laughs> correctly. Now, let me show you another method. Uh, yes, now that's a, that's a good point. If you're using your memory, you want to make sure you clear it before you start another problem. So, there's usually a key that'll either say memory clear. Uh, in a scientific calculator, you don't have to clear your memory. One way to clear your memory on a simple calculator is just press recall twice. That'll usually clear the memory. Did that clear it, get that M out of the display? Okay. Now, some students love this denominator method. Do the denominator first, don't round it. Then punch the numerator divided by what you found, and that's your final answer. Other students really like this method. So I'll show it to you, and then you can decide whichever one you want to use. When we divide, we have to go back to eighth grade now. When we divide a fraction by another fraction, what do we do with this fraction that's the divisor? Anybody remember? We flip it over, we invert it and multiply. 